Uh, welcome, everyone, um, to a talk about riddles. Uh, I had asked just a second ago if anyone knew what the uh, first part of the title was from. It is, of course, from The Hobbit, uh, and it is technically the riddle that Bilbo uses to defeat Gollum in the riddle contest, but whether or not it's a riddle is a separate question. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm interested in in riddles, um, partly because I'm, uh, well, I guess I should just introduce myself first. Okay, so I'm, my, my name is Nick Dalby, Dean of Middle School and Upper School, no, most of you students. Um, and uh, I'm also currently in a PhD program at University of Houston studying English literature, and my emphasis is in medieval literature. Um, and this last semester, actually, I, I got to spend some time uh, studying and thinking about riddles, uh, specifically by this guy, St. Aldhelm. Um, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, and, uh, but my, my interest in riddles goes way back. Uh, back to the days when my dad read The Hobbit to me as a child. Um, and uh, really kind of encountering riddles for the first time in the Riddles of the Dark chapter. Um, so that's, that's where I want to start. Uh, but then, um, as you can see based on the title as well, we're going to kind of like ex expand that out a little bit. Um, we're going to move into kind of the history of riddles and some of the theological kind of context and um, foundations of riddles uh, as well, which I think is just super fascinating. Um, I'm also going to give you a couple riddles and see how you do. Um, I promise that the stakes aren't as quite as high. I'm not, you're not going to get eaten if you don't get it right. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> I don't know, an appropriate amount of shaming or something, like, seems, seems fine. Um, so, uh, okay, so as a young boy, the first time I read the chapter in The Hobbit Riddles in the Dark, I was captivated by the strangeness of Gollum's character and the suspense of not knowing how Bilbo would fare in the riddle contest. If he won, Gollum promised to show Bilbo out of the mountains, but if he lost, Gollum would eat him for dinner. What really caught my attention, though, was the moment immediately following Bilbo's victory. He stumps Gollum by accident, and maybe by cheating, because again, like, this isn't really a riddle. This is, this is an unfair question. But Gollum, remember, kind of just takes it as a riddle, because they're in the middle of kind of giving riddles to each other back and forth, and Bilbo just kind of lets it ride. And he's like, oh, he thinks it's a, yes, it's a riddle. Um, <laughs> So uh, he, he stumps him with this question, what have I got in my pocket? But Bilbo doesn't trust Gollum to hold up his end of the bargain as Gollum is progressively getting more frustrated that he can't guess the answer to the riddle. Um, and this, despite the fact that the narrator then says, and this is a direct quotation, that the riddle game was sacred and of immense antiquity and even wicked creatures were afraid to cheat when they played at it makes you wonder about Bilbo a little bit, who is kind of cheating. Um, okay, so in that, in that moment, that, that sentence caught my, caught my attention, because um, I can remember a couple questions coming to mind. First of all, how sacred was this sacred riddle game exactly? Also, I probably didn't know what sacred meant exactly, um, but nevertheless. Uh, second, how old exactly is immense antiquity? It's kind of an intimidating phrase. In order to answer these questions, uh, as my adult self, who's done some studying now, um, I want to outline for you kind of just a brief history of riddles, particularly within the medieval tradition, and then try to connect it to some of the larger, <clears throat> excuse me, theological concerns of the Middle Ages. So, and before proceeding any further, I just want to kind of lay out a couple terms here. Um, I'll likely use the word riddle and, en and enigma interchangeably here, um, specifically when I kind of get into the Middle Ages, because those two words were interchangeable. Um, and in fact, uh, Aldhelm's riddles, that's the English translation here in Latin, is enigmata. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second. Um, okay, so brief history. So there, it turns out that there is a millennium's worth of history behind the origins of riddles and riddle games. One only has to think of the Egyptian Sphinx, who sat outside the, gate of, the gates of Thebes, asking this famous riddle of travelers who pass by. If you know the answer right away, don't, don't blurt it out. What creature has one voice, but has four feet in the morning, two feet in the afternoon, and three feet at night? What was that? Did that come from Edmonds? Yes. 
Okay. Well, so yes, that, I'm, right. So that's one of the stories that talks about the, the Sphinx's riddle. Um, but yes, that is where the answer lies. OK, yes, you guys want a rock, paper, scissors for it, or? <laughs> Do <laughs> 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 you have no faith in your daughter? <laughs> it wasn't two out of three. We were bound to get there. Yeah. It's, it's a person or a human. It's a per right man. So, um, so yes, the answer is man, and we'll see why here in a second. But the stakes for the traveler when the Sphinx would ask them this question were just as high as they were for Bilbo. So if a person answered the Sphinx's riddle incorrectly, he would be eaten instantly. Um, needless to say, the Sphinx rarely went hungry. Um, and in his Theban plays, the Greek playwright Sophocles, so this is like 5th century BC, right? Like, so that's, that's how far back we are right now, tells the story of the Sphinx's uh, eventual defeat. The ancient king Oedipus encountered the Sphinx and figured out the answer. He said it was man, and then he follows it up by saying, Man who crawls on all fours as a baby, then walks on two feet as an adult, and then uses a walking stick in old age. So four, two, three. Having answered the riddle correctly, the Sphinx dies by throwing herself off a cliff. Um, there are other stories where the Sphinx eats herself somehow, just like, like, like the, the snake, kind of like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how it would work. Um, but nevertheless, that's what happened. Okay, so in English, the word riddle has an interesting history. It's inherited from uh, Germanic languages, specifically Old English. And the Old English word is radels. R and then the letter ash, which is like that A-E together. Um, D-E-L-S. Radels, which had a wide range of meanings. Um, and depending on the context, translators can translate the word as counsel, debate, interpretation, conjecture, imagination, dark saying, and, of course, riddles. The word is also specifically connected with the word rad, again, R, Ash, D, another Old English word that meant wisdom or prudence. And so there's actually lots of names in um, like Anglo-Saxon England. You have kings like Athelrad, which would mean something like wise prince. Athel means prince, and so it was like a nice, it was a nice, you know, thing to have associated with yourself. Athelred actually also had the extra um, name of Athelred the Unready. Um, <laughs> he wasn't quite as wise as his name might make you think. Uh, things didn't go well for him. Uh, Radels and Rad also happen to be the words from which we get our modern word read. Riddles were used prominently in medieval classrooms as a method of teaching students how to read which, by definition, entailed the acquisition of wisdom by means of interpretation. So a student would learn to read the signs of the letters on the page, and then how to properly interpret those signs in light of reality and human experience. So one of the most well-known riddlers of the Middle Ages was St. Aldhelm, who um, was writing in the seventh century, this guy. Um, he was a brilliant intellectual, kind of one of those polymaths, just knew everything about everything. Um, and he was also, and this was kind of unique to him, he was also interested in promoting education. So he became the abbot eventually of Malmesbury in England um, and famously wrote this book of 100 riddles uh, entitled Enigmata. And the purpose of his riddles was twofold. Uh, one, it was to instruct students in the art of reading and interpretation. Uh, but two, it was also to instruct students in Christian doctrine, and that's a point that I'm going to come back to um, a little bit later. So riddles were an ideal pedagogical method for two reasons. First, they afford multiple interpretations. So it can be difficult to pin down a single right answer because they rely on the paradoxical connotations and observations associated with a single object. So here, we'll try out our reading skills. So this is Enigmata 47. Um, and it goes like this, so this is, this is one of all times. As pounded, gaping metal, wide, gross, round, I hang untouched by boundless sky or ground, glowing in flames and fevering with bubbles, I thus confront two fronts with different troubles as I survive both being scorched and drowned. Sometimes in a riddle, there's like a line that kind of gives it away, or it's like the key. Okay. 
or at least one that kind of like wakes you up to the like, oh, I see what they're talking about. Icarus. Does anyone want to take any guesses? Yeah. Icarus. What was that? Icarus. Icarus? Uh, no, but that's a good guess. I was thinking sun, but then oh, okay, yeah, not the drown. Like something made by like a blacksmith. Good. Yes, that's that's what I'm thinking. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You got the pounded, gaping metal. And scorched and drowned. Like that's what you do. You have to heat it up and. Yeah. Good. Right. The cauldron. Yes. Okay. It's a yeah. cauldron. Right. So you've got right. If you're talking about paradoxes, um, there's there's a lot of them in here. Uh, so the cauldron. In this, in the, in the way that he describes it here, really is enigmatic. It is both pounded, gaping metal and round. It is suspended between sky and ground. So you can imagine, right, like hanging over a fire. <clears throat> um, and it fights two battles against the heat of the fire and the potential drowning by water. So the compounding paradoxes have the effect of helping the reader see this, see this cauldron kind of in a new way, right? Like how many of you have thought about the cauldron? You know, as, as kind of being suspended and kind of built of all these paradoxes um, is kind of the point. Um, you also notice this is something um, that riddles do quite a bit. Like the object that's being spoken about um, speaks itself as an I. Um, so the world, and usually, right, the objects of riddles are kind of objects in the world, objects in the created world, kind of uh, in, in a riddle is speaking for itself. So in the medieval classroom, students confronted these riddles on a daily basis, not only to teach them how to read written letters, but also how to then start to see the world more clearly. Um, unfortunately, most of the surviving riddles from the medieval period don't come with an answer key. Um, <laughs> and given their affinity for paradox, uh, riddles often allow, like I said, for many different right answers, um, and so let's just let's just look at one of those here for a second. This is coming from the Exeter book. Um, the Exeter book is a collection of uh, riddles written in Old English. It's kind of another like main source of riddles from the medieval um, time period. Um, and oh, the other thing is they also many of the riddles in this one uh, are translations of Aldhelm's riddles. Um, so they were kind of. The other cool thing that's happening in the medieval period is you've got this like vernacular movement, like people are translating stuff out of Latin into the vernacular languages. But anyway, here's here's the riddle 47. Bound in place, deaf and dumb, making a meal of gifts that come from a man's hand. She swallows daily, sustaining treasures dearer than gold. Brought by a servant, a dark thane, sought by kings, queens, princes for benefit and pleasure. What race of shapers makes such treasure for the dark? Dumb lady to swallow is beyond my measure. I'll just tell you right now, I don't know what the answer is to this riddle. <laughs> um, neither do a lot of scholars. <laughs> So if you don't get it, neither do a lot of smart people um, who study this stuff you know, for their life's work. Um, so like I said, there's no answer key to this. Uh, and I'll just give you a list. Like, so scholars have speculated just a laundry list of possibilities here. Um, some have thought that it's talking about an oven. Some have thought it's talking about a bookcase. Mm. Some have thought it's talking about a mill. Some have said a falcon cage, and some have said pen and ink. And sure. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think you can make most of those work. Um, so instead of being a flaw, uh, this like multitude of possible right answers uh, afforded by a riddle can be construed actually as a virtue, and I think that this is exactly why it was being used in the schoolroom in the Middle Ages. There may be a range of correct answers, but there is a far wider range of wrong answers, which can only be determined, right? Like, you just can't make stuff up, right? Like, if you're really engaging with the riddle. Um, and these, but these can only be determined by close attention to the details included in any given riddle. This exercise in reading elicits a kind of interpretive elasticity uh, on the part of the reader 
which then requires the mind to exercise its powers of observation, imagination, and logic to create a set of reasonable answers. So the habits of interpretation cultivated by the study of riddles highlights, I think, their second purpose in the medieval schoolroom. They were a training ground for learning, ultimately, how to interpret the scriptures. Most students received a formal education in the early Middle Ages because they were set on a path toward a priestly or monastic vocation, where they were then going to be required to read, copy, gloss, or deliver sermons on religious texts. And if a student could learn to interpret a riddle, then they could reasonably be expected to start making strides in um, being a, a, a faithful and honest reader of uh, Holy Scripture. Um, they were also an opportunity, this is, this is a side note, uh, in the Middle Ages, right, you have to remember the context here, uh, especially in England, kind of in the British Isle um, in particular, like when Rome and the civilization of Rome kind of extracts itself from that area, uh, the people on those outer reaches of the empire have less and less contact with um, the culture of Rome, right, in Italy, and over time they start losing um, kind of their, their ability to read and speak Latin. Um, and riddles were just another way in like teaching grammar, basically, like grammar or Latin grammar. Um, so you were learning how to read Latin, uh, and then you were learning how to read Latin so that you could then read church, you know, uh, doctrine or, or other sorts of materials. Um, okay, so we might be tempted to think that comparing the scriptures to riddles is like comparing apples to oranges. Um, a medieval schoolman, however, I think would counter that both the interpretation of riddles and the interpretation of the scriptures draw on the same human faculties of observation and understanding. As a recent scholar described it, uh, riddles are a didactic form of literature which prepare the reader to, quote, approach the enigmas of scripture and stage the difficulty of interpreting the mysteries of creation. So here now I would then kind of just like to pause and enlarge the history of riddles a little further by thinking about their theological roots. So the church fathers, and here I'm also thinking specifically about St. Augustine, since he was kind of like the mo one of the most popular uh, church fathers in the, in, in the Western kind of Europe of the Middle Ages, often wrote about um, the, the difficulty of reading scripture, because scripture was often very enigmatic. Um, and a key passage for this actually comes from St. Paul in 1 Corinthians, where he writes famously, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Uh, the word in the Greek for dimly there is enigmati, uh, which then becomes in Latin enigmata, which then becomes in English enig en enigma. Right. Um, so the word here, of course, means, you know, enigmati means something like dark, dimly, obscurely. And the idea that we now see in a mirror dimly, the church fathers apply to our inability to read and understand the scriptures and the revelations of God. We do not have perfect knowledge right now. There are sayings in scripture that just continue to elude our understanding. Or, um, you know, you only have to think of some of Christ saying in the Gospels, like there's, you know, that scene uh, in John 3 where Jesus and Nicodemus are having a conversation and Jesus says, you must be born again, and Nicodemus is like, <laughs> say, what? <laughs> right? You have to enter your mother's womb again. He's like, but, uh, no, just, you know, the spirit and the wind, it blows where it listed, and like all this stuff, you know, like Jesus becoming very clear in that moment. Um, <laughs> Uh, or, or when Jesus says things like, you know, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to become as a, as a child. Uh, or, as we read this morning in Morning Prayers, the Gospel reading uh, had that wonderfully um, encouraging verse of, many are called and few are chosen. <laughs> right? Like, I don't know what's going on. Um, it's enigmatic. So the enigmatic quality of the scriptures, however, isn't the fault of God or his saints. And this is, this is something that the, the church fathers come, come back to again and again. God is not intentionally trying to confuse us. He is, according to the fathers, speaking very plainly to us. Um, and yet, we have uh, other verses, um, specifically in Proverbs, where we have uh, the writer of Proverbs saying things like this, It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. 
Um, or as, as we have in chapter one of Proverbs, and uh, we talked about this actually last semester in my eighth grade great books class, um, chapter one of Proverbs begins with this. It says, let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. And I wouldn't double check this, I don't know Hebrew, but you can go and look at the Greek uh, Septuagint of the Old Testament, and that word for riddles, the Septuagint uses, I think, mati, again. Right? So you've kind of got this really interesting resonance of this word kind of showing up in the Old and New Testament. Um, okay, so what exactly is going on? The answer, I think, is partly contained in observing the way cultural conceptions of secrecy have changed over time, specifically within a Christian intellectual tradition. Um, you know, this idea of enigma and riddles being connected to secrecy, right, is like all kind of of a piece. Uh, so, I have an image here. Um, the image on the screen, if you look at it for a second, you'll probably easily guess, is a, a manuscript illumination of the scene from Genesis where Adam and Eve attempt to hide from God after they have eaten the fruit of the forbidden tree. Christ stands at the left side of the frame, elaborately drawn, with folds in his clothing, excuse me, a staff in his right hand, and a book in his left. There is nothing to impede the image of his presence in the scene, yet there is a clear barrier in the form of a large tree which divides Christ from Adam and Eve. Not only is there a barrier, but Adam and Eve appear to be entangled in and bound by a whole other set of trees and vines. The image captures, I think on the one hand, the relationship between God's omniscience and the couple's act of hiding. God sees everything and everyone, no matter how much we try to hide. But it's also an illustration of the consequences of sin. It is not God who has gone into hiding. It is we who have hidden ourselves from him. And not only have we hidden ourselves, we have become trapped and bound by the sins in which we have attempted to take refuge. It's a visual echo, I think, of St. Paul's Now We See Through a Mirror Dimly, where Christ, from the perspective of Adam and Eve, may only be barely visible because of the way the trees and vines obstruct their view. This kind of secrecy is the effect of our post-lapsarian state, which is unnatural to us. It would be more natural, it would be truly natural for us to remain in an unimpeded and unobscured communion with God, but we have, ironically, hidden ourselves by means of sin from his omniscience. We at least thought we've hidden ourselves. Many medieval theologians and writers operate on kind of this theological assumption here presented in the image. One such perspective um, is found in Pope Gregory the Great's uh, famous Moralia in Job. This is another one of those texts that in the Middle Ages was kind of spread far and wide. Uh, and in the image for someone like Pope Gregory, uh, it would represent what he calls uh, the human sin of concealment, which is the customary vice of humankind inherited from our ancient parents. The act of hiding, in other words, is the basis for and a magnifier of sin. The Venerable Bede, writing in the 8th century, also argues that for a person to presume that he can hide from God is to commit a sin, and that to commit a sin is to hide from God. Concealment is part of a vicious, and I mean that in its literal meaning, cycle which binds and separates a person from God. This view of secrecy and concealment is, I think, very different from contemporary assumptions. Today, we are conditioned to think of secrecy as a kind of fundamental human right and as a form of personal autonomy. But early medieval writers conceived of secrecy as a state of being bound. Secrecy is a post-lapsarian phenomenon. Any attempt to hide from God has a compounding <coughs> effect on the sin originally committed. Secrecy was not a feature of individual human freedom, but a sign of personal bondage. Um, and I'll just, as a side note and as a plug, this book called The Bonds of Secrecy, it just came out last year, I think, um, kind of runs with this idea and kind of looks at how this conception of secrecy affected uh, legal aspects in like Anglo-Saxon England, um, but also kind of religious monastic orders, sort of like if this is your view of secrecy, how does that um, change the way like, you know, create laws and create um, just punishments in light of that? Um, and just, as a spoiler, uh, if you were caught not just committing a crime, but then also trying to conceal it, your punishment was worse. Um, and uh, it's, it's just fascinating, right? It's just you, you build a culture around, around this conception of secrecy. It's just very different. 
Um, okay, back to riddles. Uh, riddles, I, I'd argue, um, and this is, I guess, it's like my thesis that uh, we can discuss later, uh, are engaging, I think, this fundamental human conundrum of secrecy and divine omniscience. Riddles attempted to train readers in humility uh, by having the reader confront their own kind of intellectual uh, limitations. And in order to begin unraveling the secret hidden in a, the secret hidden in a riddle, um, or the answer that was hidden in the riddle, the reader must begin with an act of faith. That is, they have to trust that meaning exists and is accessible in the riddle, while also remaining committed to the process of solving the riddle. In the medieval education system, this was considered a first step, as I said earlier, in learning how to read and interpret this progressively more difficult text. Um, and then the kind of like the ultimate text that one could start to read then would be the scriptures. Uh, how could a person, they might ask, uh, be expected when confronted with the enigmas of scripture um, to maintain the trust and commitment necessary to unravel the truth that it contains, right? This is kind of the source of heresy in one way. Um, it's just bad hermeneutics. Um, so alongside faith, the reading and writing of riddles also developed a person's hermeneutical skills. A student in a medieval education would learn how to follow the grammar of a line, note the relationship between parallel and paradoxical images, and become familiar with their own intellectual limitations. And having developed a posture of humility and recognizing that God and his creation pose the greatest riddle and enigma for which there will be no end of our exploration. Many of the riddles from the medieval era speak specifically to this purpose. And so here I'll just conclude um, by looking at a section from Riddle 40 of the Exeter book, um, which is also a translation of one of Althelm's riddles, uh, which describes God as someone who speaks in riddles. The speaker is creation in this particular example, and he says of himself, I bind all turnings under heaven's roof, guide and sustain as God first wrought, hold shape and form, rule thick and thin, I am higher than heaven at the point king's command. I watch and wield his world treasure, the great shaper's riddle. The word for riddle in this passage is the old English word digla, um, which literally means just secret or dark, but right, you can already see the connection there with enigma. Um, and like with the Greek and Latin enigmate, it can just as easily be translated riddle here. Um, this is not my translation. The mystery of creation is dark to us, but it has been plainly set before us as a kind of riddle by God. The act of reading and writing riddles reminds us that we are the ones entangled in the trees and vines of sin. We are the ones who have hidden ourselves from God, and that only with the help of Christ, as well as a patient, careful, uh, meticulous practice and ardent desire to remove ourselves from the intricate web of sins we have woven, will we return to that perfect communion with the one who is not only the source of our life, but also waiting for us out in the open. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that part that you were talking about where people were, uh, they were hiding things, basically a sin. Is that something that you think that we did to control the masses? Oh, you like uh, from the legal side of things? Yes. Oh. If I'm a king, I don't want people hiding things. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I mean, I think that's probably definitely... Well, I don't know how much of a part of it it was. Um, it's hard to say in one way because uh, you don't, in the medieval era, you don't have the same kind of sense of separation of church and state, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's in all the words, right? Hmm. Which makes it all the more terrible and powerful, right? I mean, sure. I mean, it, it certainly sets it up to be uh, abused, right, in some pretty awful ways. Um, but uh, you know, to, to answer the question of like, well, were they doing this just to control people? Um, I don't. I don't think so. Um, I I think that they were they were kind of reasoning from a place of, well, God knows everything. Um, we know that the immediate effect of sin in the garden was for humans to hide themselves. Um, so sin uh, and concealment kind of go hand in hand, right? And if we're going to run a, a kingdom kind of based in uh, 
uh, some, you know, some kind of legitimate form of theology, right? Uh, then it makes sense, right, to, to see concealment of a crime as something um, that that makes the crime itself even even worse. Uh, and I thought you said something to the effect of like hiding things, period. Even if it wasn't oh, oh. wrong that they did. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, right. No, so actually there was a distinction there, right? Um, and this is, this, okay, so this is where that book is kind of helpful because there's, um, there's, a, there's a little bit of a tension there, especially you see in like religious or monastic communities um, because on the one hand, right, if you're a monk in a monastery, you are required to tell everything to your abbot, right, or your confessor. Um, all your sins, all your thoughts, like all the stuff, right? Uh, but that was for the sake of developing a kind of like personal or private prayer life, right? That wasn't public. Um, so, so like I said, this is this is kind of paradoxical and intention with, with with this idea of concealment. But I think it's 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 because it's a completely different thing. Um, so you have you you have this in the Middle Ages, right? You have this kind of like flourishing of hagiography. Right, this writing of saints' lives, and one of the one of the stories that kind of shows up again and again in these hagiographies is that you've got you you'll often have this character who goes and like spies on a saint, right? Who's like, oh, Saint Columba's going out to the ocean again. I wonder what sort of like magical, miraculous, you know, experience he's about to have, right? And so they like go and hide behind a rock, and then just like watching him. <laughs> pray and then like this divine light comes down on him and like the angels are coming and like all this stuff uh, and unfortunately for the guy who was spying usually what would happen in those moments is then you know someone like St. Columba would be told like hey there's someone spying on you over there um, and St. Columba would walk over and be like your soul is in peril <laughs> right? he's like how did you know I was here and he's like doesn't matter <laughs> right don't tell anyone what you saw um, because that was that the, the, the thought there is is that um, you know saint, the the saint's prayer life, the spiritual life, right? Whatever whatever relationship he has with God is just purely between him and God, right? That is no one else's business unless God decides to make it other people's business, and he does sometimes. And that's where like the hagiographer, it's a little bit of an ironic kind of situation, right? You're like, hold on a second, like. How did the guy who's writing the hagiography find out about the guy who was spying on the saint who was having this experience? And you're like, what's the difference between those two guys? Um, and one of the things that comes right isn't the hagiographer spying in some way. Um, the answer is sort of yes, uh, but the the difference that gets kind of drawn out from that is the the spy is spying from doubt, from like a place of doubt. He doesn't really believe, or he like needs to be like he needs his uh, you know, his questions to be confirmed, like, is, is this guy really that holy, right, sort of thing, whereas the hagiographer is writing his hagiography from a place of faith, right, um, it's the idea that, like, no, like, his faith has already made him, uh, I don't know, eligible, right, to, to kind of get a glimpse into this saint's kind of spiritual life, um, and it's to people like that as well, not just people writing hagiographies, but then, you know, a saint will kind of like walk into a room and this divine light will shine down upon them and the monk, the unsuspecting monk, will just kind of be bowled over by it. Um, and the saint will say something like, you know, that vision was for you, don't tell anyone, um, kind of thing. Uh, so there is a difference. So it's not just like hiding, period. Right? There's, there's different kinds of concealing, different kinds of hiding. If you're, if you're hiding or concealing from a place of like uh, fear um, from having uh, committed a sin of some kind, committed a crime of some kind, right? you're hiding for the wrong reasons. Like that's actually bad. Or if you're hiding from the, or, or if you're like, again, if you're like on the other side of it and you're spying from a place of doubt, that would be considered bad. Um, or it would be kind of like, it would be that compounding effect of sin and concealment. But then there's other, I mean, there's also this thing like in the Middle Ages, there was this, uh, you can also see it in the architecture of a lot of the churches. They started building more and more oratories, which were just like little private places of prayer where someone could go and pray without you know, a bunch of people looking at them sort of thing, right? So there was this recognition that like God sees all and if you're hiding things for sinful reasons, that's going to be worse for you in the end. But if you are, but you also do need to go and be with God privately um, to develop your own spiritual life as well. So. Any other questions? Yeah. 
questions. What was the book that she had? Not the first one, the second one. That one. Yeah, this one. The Bonds of Secrecy by Benjamin Saltzman. Um, I'll warn you, like this is like a, this is very academic. Um, so it, it's a slog in places, um, but it's really fascinating. I don't think that the guy who wrote this himself is a Christian, because there are a few moments where he's talking about kind of medieval Christian doctrine, where I'm like, mm, you didn't know, that's not right. Like at one point he like, he's, he compares God's divine omniscience to, um, I don't know if you're familiar with like, uh, the idea of the panopticon, right, which is this like universal surveillance sort of <laughs> mechanism that was developed in like the 18th century and then it was like again kind of renewed. It's like used in prison systems, like that's the idea, right? It's just like, ah, someone is just back there watching what everyone's doing and that's kind of like God. And I was like, no, Benjamin, that's not right. <laughs> that's not right. <laughs> uh, I, I have two questions. Well, yeah. one's a comment, the other one's a question that I have for you that's applying this to something else. And I don't know, you don't have to answer if you want to. Um, the first thing was what you were talking about, about like the saints, like hagiography hey, hey, and um, observation and like communication between people and secrecy was making me think about, in, obviously in the Gospels with Christ, who frequently will do miraculous things and be like, and don't tell anybody about that. Like the life-changing thing I just did to you. And the person just like runs off and tells yeah. Um, I was like, why did you tell me not to tell? <laughs> I don't know why you told I, it's yeah. like It's one of those things in scripture where it's like, that's an enigma to me. You know, like, why clearly that person has no self-control and is now going to go yell at everyone that they can see. Um, why did you tell them to keep a secret? Um, the other thing I was going to say was, the title of your lecture is a reference to The Hobbit. Yeah. And Tolkien, I don't know, I, I missed the first few minutes, but Tolkien is like obviously aware of this medieval inheritance of yeah. ruling. And so I was wondering if you could like apply what you know about riddling and secrecy to like the character work that's being done between Gollum mm -hmm. and Bilbo because I feel like Bilbo does Gollum one dirty and it's yeah. right. Yeah. Like that riddle is not a riddle. Right. And Gollum is right about it. What have yeah. I got in my pocket? is violating all of the rules. Right. There's not like a grammar you can follow to change, like uh, all the parameters that you gave for riddling are violated by Bilbo, but he's the good guy. Yeah. So. Oh, well, yeah, it's, um, I, yeah, I, I, I talked about that just briefly at oh, the okay. beginning, but no, 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 but, but it's, it's just worth repeating because in, in that particular context, Bilbo doesn't actually ask the question as a riddle. Gollum just takes it as a riddle and then Bilbo's just like, <laughs> it is. Um, so in one way he's like uh, not totally incriminated, but no, but he is. Like, like it's not a riddle, and he knows it's not a riddle. And then there's that line, like right after, um, right after where he says, you know, uh, Bill became distrustful of Gollum because it was you know, the real game so sacred and of immense antiquity and all this sort of stuff. You know, you just cheated. Um, uh, yeah, in terms of the character work, I, I'm not, well, I haven't thought about that specifically. I mean, it's, it's definitely, I think it's definitely there, right? Because when you get the smiles, you get, you, you know, uh, Bilbo knows he has to speak in riddles to the dragon because dragons like word games. Um, so it's interesting that he gives. When did that happen? When did dragons start to like word games? <laughs> They're tricksy, you know? And just, yeah, I don't, I don't know. They read a riddle once. <laughs> they were like, this is our thing. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, right. So anyway, so, so you do have that moment. Um, uh, the dragon being obviously the bad guy there, uh, being the one who enjoys, enjoys riddles. Uh, trying to think if there's... He seems to know the riddles from when he used to not be gollum -y. At least, well, no, some of his answers he, oh, yeah. he gets from being right, yeah. not Gollum. I'm just yeah. wondering, like, is it supposed to be an association of, like, Gollum and the dragon both like riddles, and that means you're sinister? Or is it, like, yeah. the Gollum who likes riddles is, like, the piece of him that likes them and knows them is, like, the piece that's accessing his old self before the ring destroys him? Yeah. I don't know. I No, I, I think that that might be right, because um, as soon as you said that, I was like, oh, right, like, because... 
almost all riddles, like the answer has to do with something in creation. Yeah, right? and it like seems like they're supposed to be, a, it's like an edifying practice from mm -hmm. what you described. Like, so if yeah. somebody's cultivating skill in riddling, it's supposed to be helpful, like yeah. spiritually. And so it seems like, right. I don't know, it just seems like a practice that runs contrary to like, and then you're a really good super villain in a book. And there's yeah. two villains in this book who are right. like riddles, A plus. Yeah. It, right, I'm thinking there's also that line Gandalf has at the beginning of Fellowship of the Ring where he talks about uh, Gollum having like a chink in his mind where light was still kind of like shining through, right? And so I, I, I wonder if, that, if there's some relation there. I'm also thinking too like Gollum and, and Smaug have spent um, the majority of their life at this oh, point yeah. living in a mountain. In hiding um, things. Hiding yeah. things, hoarding things. Um, oh, that's true, yeah, concealment. Isolation. Yeah, it's the it's the it's the bad form of concealment. Yeah, um, it's that. It's yes, <laughs> but not with yours. Right. I mean, if you look at those vines in one way, they kind of look dragony. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm reading into it. Um, uh, yeah. Um, you know, Gandalf is kind of enigmatic, like as a character. Uh, I. There, so there is, there is that difference, right? Like there's riddles as a kind of game or kind of exercise, and then there's just wise sayings that strike us as a kind of riddle, right? That seem enigmatic. Um, uh, actually, I'm mean, again. Yeah, I'm reminded we were talking about this with the Tao Te Ching. Um, like, why? Why does the Tao? Like all those poems in the Tao? Like they're just not very straightforward. Like why? Why aren't you just coming out and telling me what, what it is, right? Um, and I don't think it's like a, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's like uh, Lao Tzu is like being uh, intentionally obscure. Um, there, there is something true, and I don't know if maybe you've had this experience, where you have said something like as clear and as accurate as you could possibly say it, and yet the person you're talking to is just looking at you dumbfounded. To say this, right? Um, you kind of just spoken a riddle to them <laughs> in, in one way. Um, but there's also a sense in which riddles are, uh, and this is, I think, is connected to the idea of, of wise sayings, right? Like reality is always, it's always kind of gesturing to something beyond uh, the words of the riddle itself. Or the words of the, the wise saying itself. There's always it's kind of it's always pointing you to some sort of a kind of like transcendent something um, that you couldn't you couldn't actually put it accurately and comprehensibly in words. Um, and I think so. It's it's really interesting to think about that then too in light of like riddles being mostly about kind of natural objects, right? Like pointing to a tree in in a riddly sort of fashion. Right, which okay, you might be able to figure it out, but then you might be able to figure out the answer, but then you start, but then you're stuck having to think about like, well, what is a tree exactly, right? And if you sit with that question long enough, you might you might find that you don't really know. Um, but maybe, maybe in that moment, now I'm getting kind of weirdly mystical. Like maybe you're experiencing <laughs> a tree <laughs> for the first time. Um, as you sit and contemplate it in that way, right? Because you're having now to do it without, without the help of, of language in, in one sense. But it was language that kind of got you there, right? It kind of pushed you to that moment, um, and then and then you were able to kind of like sit in the experience in some way. Yeah. So like, as I'm thinking about it, like the whole Bible could be considered right? Yeah. It's, it's it's very very colorful, and very very colorful. Yeah. What are they talking? About? Just go read Revelations, right? It's just like, oh my God. <laughs> right. And so, and you, you know, we think, we, we read scholars that have done this and that and say, oh yeah, well maybe this means this or maybe this means that. But maybe what I'm thinking is that lends to the uh, long lasting nature of, of the literature that we're reading because we don't know. We're still questioning, we're still having discussions, we're still reading Plato 2,500 years plus because. Well, what is the right answer? I mean, so maybe that riddle and that that struggle with the riddle helps sharpen us in some way, or keeps us connected to something that's more eternal. Yeah, 
No, I think I think that's exactly right. I mean, there, you know, at, at St. Constantine we talk about the dialectic, right? And, and I think the dialectic is, you know, riddles are dialectic in that way because the dialectic is the sort of thing that when you engage in it, <clears throat> you're kind of you're you're directed towards something that's that's bigger than than what you could express in words um, very often, and. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you, if you stop and really try to read scripture slowly and, and as with as much comprehension as you possibly can, like, you, you're just going to keep running into, uh, what does this mean? yeah, right, you're just going to be like, oh, I, I think, I mean, but you, like, we all have this experience, like, as you grow up, like, I, I, you know, when you were 13, you thought you understood one thing, that when you turn 23, you realize, like, wow, I had that totally wrong, right, and you, you, you understand it in a new way. Um, so it's kind of like this constantly expanding sort of uh, understanding. Um, that I think something like the scriptures is just kind of telling us, yes, and this goes on and on and on and on. So would it be accurate to say that the purpose of a riddle or of an enigma like scripture is not concealment per se, but actually a different kind of revelation. It's it's making something known yeah. to a different sense than just your logic. Yeah. No, I think that's right. I think revelation is a good word to use. Because I think right, I think that's kind of what's going on in this image as well, right? Like like God is revealing himself. He's he's in the garden. He's like, where are you? Right? It's not like God is like hiding behind a rock going like, did you sin? Right? Like sort of because I can't be in the presence of that if you sin. Right? Like that's just not my nature. Um, no, he's just very much like, here I am. Right? Where are you? And they're all tangled up behind a tree. Um, you know, it's it's right, I so I I, I think it's uh, yeah. Riddles are participating in that kind of mode of like revealing, revealing. I think I'm just the mystery of creation, and then, and then you know that then is connected to the mystery of who God is. Um, I mean, if, if you were trying to hide something, hide something, you wouldn't put it in a riddle. You would just not say it. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah exactly. You would just be silent. Don't um, give me clues to what your password is. Just yeah, don't say just, anything don't, to me about your password. Right. Yeah. That would be easier. Um, no. That, yeah. That's right. Like, why would you bother with a riddle if you were trying to hide something? Would. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and riddles, uh, you know, are, are also just kind of fun, right? There, there's a sort of joy in, in, in learning a riddle. Um, solve it. I mean, just maybe even just like solving puzzles in general. They, they can also cause an existential crisis sometimes. Um, my wife and I play the New York Times mini word, cross, mini crossword. Sometimes she's way better at it than I am. And whenever it takes me like five minutes and it took her 30 seconds, I just think that there's something wrong with me. <laughs> like, 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 I'm deficient in some way. Um, so, but I, but I think that that's the, like, that's the humility aspect of riddles too. That's why the medievals loved them so much as, as a kind of educational tool, because it was, um, you know, because it turns out that if you're, if you're really wanting to like, encounter reality, if you want to encounter the transcendent in some way, like you're gonna have to like open yourself up to it. You're gonna have to have a particular kind of posture, and the word we usually use for that is something like humility, right? Like to recognize, like I, I don't know everything, and I'm in the presence of something much greater than I am. Um, and riddles kind of are like a, a stepping stone in that direction. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's like what you were, Mr. Jones, what you were saying about like all of scripture. Essentially, it's it's easier for us as humans to stop thinking about something if we think we know what we saw or what yeah. we read. Like, I know what that means, and so I'm gonna stop thinking about it and go to something else. But if everything that you read is making you go, what? It causes contemplation. Yeah. And so it's funny in a riddle, because you start trying to contemplate a thing that you don't, but you don't know what it is. So you're contemplating its qualities, its position in the universe, the objects around it, none of which are named, yeah. uh, and so you're contemplating a thing that you don't you don't even know what category it, it's in. You know, is it something? Is it a tree? Is it a rock? Is it something that a person made? Is it something in my house? Yeah. Um, is it my hair? You just you don't know at all, and so this idea of like working on contemplating without perception um, 
and perception comes like through understanding. It does seem, yeah, it's like a posture of humility so that you don't open your Bible and go like, yep, 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 I know what all of this means. This is all so simple and only idiots wouldn't be Christians. Like it's, it's challenging yeah. and it's hard. Yeah. And so keeping it challenging keeps us on our toes. Yeah. And it reminds us we do have to contemplate from humility or else it would, it, it's not that, it's not that, it's not that easy. The people who like, yeah, they read when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Like, well, there it is. There's your answer. Like, nothing else to talk about there. <laughs> Excuse me? Um, I mean, the other thing I'm thinking about right now, too, is, like, there's an obvious connection here between uh, Christ as the Logos, Christ as the Word, right, becoming incarnate, right? This, this kind of transcendent reality kind of embodying itself uh, among us um, is... You know, is, is something that I think riddles will make you think about. Um, like, how, how can an embodied thing become transcendent, right? Or, or make you think of transcendence? Um, so, anyway. So, why I probably could never be a materialist. I just look at a tree and suddenly I'm thinking about, like, transcendence. <laughs> <laughs> you get from I know you said we don't have all the answers but like how important was there being an answer to this sort of like yeah. scholastic or I, you talked about like a set of answers that we now think would apply yeah. but like that one that you said one of the answers was maybe an oven that was the old that was the only thing that made sense to yeah. me when I read it I was like the South Pelican like oven yeah um, I didn't understand the one like the servants except like Kings don't know how to cook, and so they'd be super. They're like, "What cool guy knows how to cook? I don't. Yeah. Thanks for the food, guy." Because he like brings it from the oven. That's at least what I thought was happening. Um, like, how important was it that each riddle had like one? Was it important for us uh, to have yeah. an answer, or was it just sort of like? Yeah, I mean, I don't. So I honestly don't know if we have the answer to that uh, mm -hmm. because, again, we we don't have an answer book. Um, we also just don't have a ton of information about how they were used like in, in education. We, we, we have a lot, but like still not, not like a day-to-day, -day, right. like, I don't know, were the students beaten if they got the wrong answer? <laughs> like, I, it seems possible, um, but, yeah, it's, it's fine, Logan, it's fine, I don't know. It's easy. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if we have the answer to that. I mean, there was obviously an insistence that there, there was at least an answer to, to all of them. Um, and that was, that was kind of the important point. But um, it, it also could have just varied between like place to place as well, um, kind of the way that they were used generally. Yeah, so I'm not sure. I'd like to hear from one of the students. <laughs> What's your favorite riddle? What's my favorite riddle? <laughs> what have I got in my bag? It's <laughs> my favorite one that I just made up right now. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's. It's hard. It's okay. It's hard for me to remember the riddles uh, often because. Well, especially with all of them. Like, there's a hundred of them, um, and they don't all stick in my in my brain the same way. Uh, his his riddle 100 is probably one of my favorites, but it's, it's long. Um, it is 81, 2, 3, 83 lines. Um, the answer is creation. Uh, so, uh, there you go. Um, I didn't. I didn't figure that one out on myself. Uh, sorry, I wasn't gonna read all these right now. I'm trying to figure that out and spoil it for you. Um, uh, but yeah, I I say that that one's maybe my favorite. Um, wait, wait, wait. There, wait, there might be a whole lot. Let me see if I remember. This one's maybe my favorite one. Okay, it's short. Um, uh, this is uh, Enigma 41. Don't lose faith, though talk carries little weight. 
but through my words expose your trusting heart. Near lofty higher clouds I can inflate. If I'm beheaded, all my flesh is shed. Yet if I'm pressed by weight from someone's head, I always seem to want to shrink in part. Yeah, I'll read it one more time. Uh, it says, don't lose faith, though talk carries little weight. But through my words, expose your trusting heart. Near lofty higher clouds, I can inflate. If I'm beheaded, all my flesh is shed. Yet, if I'm pressed by weight from someone's head, I always seem to want to shrink in part. Rocket ship? <laughs> Grapes. Why I don't grapes? think so. <laughs> um, grapes, no. I think I could see that. You gotta remember, like this is like seven hundreds, six hundred, seven hundreds. Yeah, uh, actually, it is a pillow. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> pillow. Like so, like that sleeve and rest. Right. Yeah. But but I think the reason why it's my favorite is one is because the answer is pillow. Like it's just kind of silly, <laughs> a silly answer to it. Um, but but the opening part I think is, um, and this is something that the other kind of scholars have commented on, is like those first two lines uh, are kind of like an encapsulation of. Uh, all Helm's project in these riddles. Um, so there's something kind of significant and serious about, about this funny little riddle. Um, and those first two lines are, don't lose faith, though talk carries little weight, but through my words expose your trusting heart. Right? It's kind of a, a prologue, but also a, remember what we're doing. Remember what you're studying and why you're studying it. It's, is the pillow talking that? Is the pillow like, yeah. expose your heart, like, lay right, down. Right, right, right. Scream right. um, <laughs> into the pillow. Uh, it's, okay, well, so this is this is tricky with riddles, is, is the eye in riddles. Um, you know, because like I said earlier, like, the, the eye is usually the object speaking um, in the riddle, but sometimes it's also the riddler speaking. Um, so trying to figure that out, like who's speaking when is, is not always very clear. Um, I, I tend to read that, I mean, even if it is the pillow talking, that might make it more <laughs> endearing to me. Um, like here's, a, here's a pillow telling me, don't lose faith. Um, just rest your head here. Uh, but, but also, I, you know, I, I feel like all Helm's voice is coming out in that as well, yeah. right? Um, encouraging his students. Good question. We'll end with that. <laughs> Thank you all.